some time. Good evening, my name is Hoimonti Bakchi and I'm an independent researcher and freelance corporate communication trainer. I welcome you to the stories of tribal identity and culture that will explore the role of tribal literature and tribal representation in literature in shaping cultural identity and ideology curated under TMYS Review, December 2023. In collaboration with Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives, University of Victoria, also calling for submissions of essays, poems, short stories under the project. To know more about the project submission guidelines, the project architecture is given in the website www.tellmeyourstory.biz. This evening, I consider myself very privileged to be in the company of our esteemed panelist, Dr. Subhadra Channa Mitra, Dr. Ananya Datta Gupta, and Dr. Geetika Ranjan, who will shortly share their views and insights with us. The topic for today's discussion is evidence of tribal spirituality and religion institutionalization of the belief system under the sub-theme fiction, non-fiction, and poetry by tribal writers. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers. But uh, first, let me introduce Dr. Subhadra Channa Mitra. She has retired as a professor, Department of Theology, University of Delhi in 2016. At present, she's Senior Vice President of IUAES, International Union of uh, Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences from 2018, and Chair of the Commission on Marginalization and Global Apathy. Her research interests are in marginalization and identity studies, gender, cosmology, and religion, environment, urban communities, and landscape. Her publications include Gender in South Asia, Cambridge University Press, Life as a Dalit Sage, uh, in The Inner and Outer Selves, Oxford University Press, and Gender, Livelihood, and Environment with Marlon Porter, Anthropological uh, Perspectives on Indian Tribes, and more than 800 scholarly papers. She has been recipient of awards like Charles Wallace Fellowship, UK Fulbright Lecturer, Fulbright Scholar in Residence, uh, Visiting prof Professor to Maison de Sciences de Lome, Paris, Visiting Scholar, Kyoto University, Visiting Scholar, University of Kentucky, USA, Visiting Professor, Salvador, Brazil, Fellow of the Society for Applied Anthropology, USA, President of the Indian Anthropological Association. She has received SC Roy Gold Medal from Asiatic Society and Distinguished Teacher Award, Delhi University, 2016. We are delighted to have you on the panel, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Our second speaker for the session is Dr. Ananya Datta Gupta. She has taught at Vishwa Bharti for over two decades. She secured an ample degree in early modern English literature as a postgraduate Felix Un, uh, Oxford University in 2001. She successfully completed her doctoral work on the early modern representation. Her revised uh, Orient Black Swan uh, annotated edition of uh, Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, Book One, continues to be in the worldwide circulation as she has several and other scholarly articles, essays, and book reviews published in national and international journals to her credit. She, were, she was Charles Wallace India Trust Visiting Fellow at Center for Research in Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, Cambridge in 2015. Besides many invited lectures within the state, she has presented several academic papers on early modern literature in the past two years, notably at World Shakespeare Congress, Singapore, uh, the Oxford University Type Conference 2021 and Asian Shakespeare Association 2022. Her most recent paper was at International Conference on Island Literature at 
Department of Germanic and Romance Studies, University of Delhi. We are delighted to have you on the panel, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining this evening. Thank you. Our third speaker for the session is uh, Dr. Geetika Ranjan. She is the professor, head of the Department of Anthropology at Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, Meghalaya, a product of Loreto Convent, Lucknow, and Loreto University. Professor Geetika Ranjan's area of interest range from working on tribal and rural development, literary anthropology, anthropology of children, diaspora and migration and ethnographic research and has been working on international and national projects rela uh, related to these areas. But recently completed international project on situation of Nepalese migrant workers uh, working in the coal mines of Jaintia Hills. Meghalaya was in collaboration with universities of Copenhagen, Aarhus in Denmark, and with Kathmandu University in Nepal. Her latest study is on the situation of girl-child domestic laborers in Lucknow City, recipient of prestigious awards like Young Scientist Award given by Indian Science Congress and Research Award awarded by the University Grant Commission, Professor Geetika Ranjan's research interests are well reflected in various international and national publications and as invited lecturers, lectures in uh, international and national conferences. She carries the honor of being nominated by the Ministry of Environment and Forests, Government of India as a member of a committee constituted for monitoring the village relocation from the tiger reserves in India in 2012. We are delighted to have you on the panel, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining this evening. Thank you. And just one correction, which I had requested, but maybe it skipped your mind. I'm no longer the head of the department, so uh, that can be taken back. But yes, thank you very much for be having me on board. Thank you. We will now open the forum for discussion. I would request uh, Subhadra, ma'am, to share her insights. Ma'am, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Haimanti. Uh, I am Subhadra Mitra Channa. Huh? Mitra is my maiden name. Okay. That's a little slight correction. <laughs> and Sorry I have not that. written 800 papers, 80 plus. 800 is too much. <laughs> I can't find that. Anyway. So uh, the topic under discussion is of tribal spirituality and religion. Now my first, uh, which I have also discussed in many papers, uh, which I have published, I mean my book, specifically in my book, The Inner and Outer Cells, which deals with the uh, pastoral community on the borderlands of Himalayas. Uh, when we are looking at people, tribals or indigenous, as we call them, those who do not follow what we call as doctrinal religions. Doctrinal religions are characterized by a bounded system, rules, regulations, maybe a book, maybe some uh, prophet or messiah. You know, they have a, what you call, they are institutionalized in many ways in terms of personal. When we are looking at indigenous people, uh, people uh, who are very close, uh, close to nature, who are also living in relatively uh, less hierarchical, less uh, structured societies. What we are dealing with is our cosmologies. Cosmologies meaning the way these people construct or live in the world that is around them, the lived world of existence. First and foremost, there you will not find something which is called a belief system, which is separate from the ontological existence. Like uh, when I was in the Himalayas, the people told me, I mean, the people used to live as if the non-humans, I, I can use the term supernatural, which is not also very good when it is applied to them. Those who are not human, which includes nature, personified uh, nature, as well as various kinds of, you know, non-human beings uh, whom they may call by various names. 
no all they are part of that same environment social as well as you know natural so the trees the leaves the flowers the streams and the various beings who populate that area they live in a constant kind of an interaction with it they are not gods who are in the in the heaven somewhere far away who have but they are just people around them they are living being i mean living in that sense for example i was talking to this person in a himalayan village and they were saying he told me the difference between us humans are uh, manushya and devta are the only thing is that the devta are kind of not confined by time and space meaning they do not age or grow old like us they do not uh, they were not born they do not die so they are not confined to any time dimension and also they can go wherever they want so they are not restricted by space so apart from that they believe that these beings have the same emotions uh, the same relationships like the gods and goddesses they have married their spouses they have children they are uncle, somebody related to somebody and also like when the inter- and there is a constant interaction going on so this separation so what i'm trying to say is that you cannot really make a difference between the spiritual and the ontological it's, it's part of the same world it is a lived existence of interact so i have in fact this i have mentioned clearly that so in that case there is no boundary for example uh and this was probably true of uh, other religions also uh like uh, when i went to japan uh, japan you know shinto religion is like hinduism a very ancient religion the ancient religions which were which are exactly like these tribal religions indigenous because they have no specific uh, you know um, trigger of existence like they were not preached by a uh, uh, you know a messiah or a prophet so there i found you know this god from india there is laksh i mean you go to a shinto shrine i and distinctly you can see vishnu lakshmi some uh, lakshmi san because a sacred being can be from anywhere so sacred what does sacred mean here somebody with more power than humans sacred beings are those who can exert their power they are more power they can cause diseases you can displease them they will cause misfortunes if you please them they will bless you there are beings uh, sometimes your ancestors also become sacred beings sometimes somebody who had lived earlier in the village can become a sacred being because they attain power and so on so forth they can come from different places so this like this is it. like for example these uh, uh, bhutias the jar bhutias i studied on the himalayan border they believe in the gangotri shrine they believe in ganga they believe in buddha they believe in their own indigenous spirits here there everywhere all i mean there is no separation like uh, in one village uh, i was told that this is their village god who is the snake god and this is buddha and they are both in who is also a god a sacred being and buddha and the snake god is uh, are in constant interaction with each other they converse they solve problems together so what uh, so in that we i really want to emphasize this point that this is a very different mode of a cosmology is different the vision is different the understanding is very different from the way uh, some of us i would not say every one of us some of us understand uh, religion as something which is very bounded where one religion is separate from another where the one god belongs here and one god belongs there they they it's okay i mean you can be a sacred being from anywhere so is fine you may believe in that person you may not believe in that person but a sacred being is a thing so this and and the whole process is just about different distribution of power some people have some some 
parts of the cosmological order have some kind of power. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your insightful observations. Um, we look forward to hear more about uh, your observations. Um, so now I would request um, Ananya, ma'am, to share her insights. Ma'am, over to you now. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Das Gupta, and thank you, Ms. Bakshi, for having me here. Though I feel completely like an imposter because I'm an outsider to the field, and I'm sure that was quite obvious from uh, the very generous bio note that you read out. Um, what qualifies me, if at all, very um, a kind of marginally to even broach such a subject is the fact that I've lived in a place like Shantiniketan in Birbhum, which is very interesting in terms of, um, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not saying this academically so much as experientially. I think Birbhum happens to be a very fascinating melting pot of fates. And there are other places we can think of which are melting pots of culture, but I'm talking in terms of, you know, um, a place that is, uh, that has, you know, kind of very deep roots into syncretism and a very, and a kind of syncretism that is very organic. I mean, I'm talking about a place which has deep roots in terms of intersections between, between Buddhist practices and tantric practices. And what I, what struck me, um, you know, and therefore I, I think somewhere I, I think I'd like to propose a kind of ethnographic graphic methodology is the only one that's available to me. And, um, and perhaps to kind of fine tune that a, a more autoethnographic uh, kind of approach, because I haven't really uh, been a participant in the lives of um, the lived in experience as Professor Channa was, exp uh, was explaining of the Adivasi communities that live uh, on the fringe of Shantiniketan and Vishwabharati and are a very integral part of the workforce, shall we say, um, and, and, and have been assimilated, their way of life has been assimilated into the ethos that Shantiniketan and Tagore kind of, um, uh, a, a kind of Tagore was responding to when he uh, kind of built on the idea of Shantiniketan as a learning space, as a community space. Uh, but, uh, you know, I haven't really kind of interacted them, with them in the kind of sustained way uh, enough to be able to talk about them uh, with any degree of assurance. So I can only approach it in terms of a, a loose autoethnographic uh, kind of mode through which I can talk or, you know, very honestly speak about the reception and responses I bring to it as somebody who, uh, who who is sort of an erstwhile metropolitan who's coming in and experiencing and was somewhere quite excited at the prospect of, of uh, finding people of the Adivasi community uh, so visibly around us. And uh, so I kind of tried to counter that or uh, redress this by actually speaking to a student of mine uh, and I'm very grateful to Moshumi Tudu for, um, a, you know, kind of sharing the, uh, the insights that she did and some of which I'm going to be drawing upon as I speak. So I, um, and so more on those uh, details later, but I, I cannot, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd like to begin by um, corroborating, if, if uh, though that's probably not the right word, the reading that Professor Channa offered about uh, what she called the, onto, the overlap of the ontology and the, the cosmopolit, polit, uh, cosmo, cosmological uh, kind of faith practices in another part of India, because um, that's exactly what I encounter um, uh, in uh, or in in um, the narrative that Moshumi Tudu uh, offered to me, and all this kind of began with um, you know uh, me attending her wedding where I, I, I saw practices, I saw rites and rituals, and later she would recount some of them, some of those that I missed, which uh, underlined for me yet again, how much um, I, Tagore may have either implicitly or consciously uh, adapted from uh, the, the kind of 
very ecologically inflected, ecologically rooted way of living and way of, uh, shall we say, practicing faith uh, that the Adivasis of, of, of the neighborhoods have. And um, so, so that has been a revelation in, in what one sense, but also somewhere um, a somewhat a saddening reality check because I see also a lot of disjunction between theoretically gesturing towards the Adivasi community, uh, you know, theoretically um, acknowledging our indebtedness as, you know, uh, as members of a com kind of evolved community, communitarian, communitarian way of life, which Anthony Kiton is supposed to be all about, and, um, and not quite engaging with the uh, with the lived in reality, the everyday experiences, the privations of being an Adivasi there. So that's also something that I'm trying to process. Um, and I was alerted to that disjunction a great deal, um, you know, when I had this conversation with my student, Moshumi. Uh, ha having said that, I think some of that disjunction would be available to us in terms of the practices of in art in particular. Um, you know, uh, we all, whenever we talk, think in terms of the Adivasi community and uh, the interaction between the city and the country and, its, and, the, and the fraughtness of that representation, one iconic film that all comes to our mind is Arunne Din Ratri uh, by Satyajit Ray. But I, I was wondering as I was kind of, um, uh, you know, thinking uh, my way through uh, what you are looking for observations. And I, I was disturbed by, by the fact that even somebody like Ray, who had spent so much time in Kuala Bhabun, um, would ultimately have had to um, recruit Simi Garewal as somebody to impersonate uh, Duli in the film. Uh, he couldn't, um, if, and for reasons I'm sure that he would know best, and, and I'm sure legitimate reasons, perhaps it would have been extremely difficult to approach an Adivasi uh, community asking for somebody to take that part, uh, to perform, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody like Duli, somebody who belonged to that community. But um, I believe, I hope we have reached a stage where we don't have to, uh, we don't have to encounter impersonations from mainstream society, uh, impersonations that, in a way, reinforce the gaps that there are, that there are. Uh, so I am deeply uh, kind of uh, I'm both kind of intrigued and preoccupied with these uh, these disjunctions and these problems of perception uh, between what we understand or what we even kind of very superficially assume to know about what it means to be an Adivasi, even in terms of the very uh, simplified, oversimplified overlaps that I'm talking about, you know, um, they are very ecological, their practices, their rites and rituals, and their, uh, particularly in, in respect of marriage, in respect of even, um, uh, you know, funeral practices, everything is um, the birth of a, uh, of a, of an infant. So at every, uh, you know, stage of life, they too have kind of organic recourse to, um, you know, uh, the natural ecological, uh, shall we say, foundations of the way they live. And there are fascinating stories which I'd like to share later. But I am talking about uh, what I'm trying to, I don't have a, a kind of seamless theoretical framework for this i'm speaking rather anecdotally but what i'm uh, what i'm trying to struggle what i'm rather struggling with is to come up with intelligible and um, if you like uh, truly honest uh, rooted readings of adivasi practices so uh, so uh, I, I kind of come from the other end of the spectrum um, and um, and I, I, I see this disjunctions also in terms of, uh, and I think to go to at some level, all of us in the present, that is Shanti Niketan, um, would be able to relate to this tormentedness, this tornness in somebody in none other than Tagore himself. I'm, I'm referring in particular to two very fascinating uh, verse texts. One of them is a song called Shautali Chele. 
uh, which is love, which is very interestingly uh, a monsoon song, where he um, identifies the Shautali Chele almost as a uh, you know it's fascinating. It's very pantheistic as a cloud. So he doesn't see a distinction, I and mean, there's a complete kind of merger between uh, the human form and what he sees as nature. I think that's the connection that he tries to, uh, to draw between what it means to be a, a Shautali, uh, Shautali uh, a, a human form, an individual is becomes kind of almost, uh, if you like, is, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, is subsumed under the environment. And on the other hand, this, these are, both of these are late texts. One is from 1939, the song that I, just mentioned another is from 1935, which interestingly is the Shantali May, which is a longish poem, which too is all about how a particular Shantali girl is almost like a poem. I mean, her form is 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 uh, is art itself, and we see um, representations by Nandolal Bosch, which would kind of um, which which would be visual, um, uh, shall we say. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, translations of what Tagore is talking about. So in this poem, however, the poem that that, that poem ends with an, almost on a confessional note with Tagore saying, uh, but this beautiful, uh, this innocent girl, that too, of course, you know, there's a romanticization which we can problematize. Um, uh, this girl is now a laborer and she's providing me with the earth that I need to build my house. So I have, um, so I have at some level commoditized her. I've turned her into um, a, a laborer. I am, I am drawing upon her resources. Uh, so there's a kind of a, a, an admission of guilt in that poem, but also an admission of socioeconomic reality. So, you know, that, that that's the kind of problematic that I would like to propose. I mean, A, how much do we know about uh, what it means to be spiritual in um, uh, and in the way in which the Adivasi is? I mean, so the guy to Chakraborty Spivak's uh, Can the Subaltern Speak would be, an, would be a good point of, uh, of entry here. I mean, um, Moshumi could... I could approach Moshumi, Moshumi could approach me, and we could have a conversation because uh, in many ways she has assimilated into the mainstream education system. Um, and I, I was trying to kind of give back to her and motivate her to write about their spiritual practices and the overlap between their cultural and spiritual practices. But wouldn't that also somewhere be compromised by the fact that she would there would be an anxiety to be intelligible to the mainstream? She would have to write in Bangla or in English. Um, so the conversation was possible because she was already translating herself. And any and so so there are so there is that issue about whether we know anything at all and whether whether knowing in the in the methodologies that we usually approach would really lead to a a, a truly uh, shall we say adjusted assimilated um, understanding of their of the kind of practices we are talking about, but maybe more on that later. Thank you so much, Ananya, ma'am. That was really fascinating to hear about your experiences. Um, I'm sure we'll get to know more about it uh, in some more time. I would now request uh, Geetika, ma'am, to share her insights. Ma'am, over to you now. Thank you, Hemanti. And uh, thank you, Dr. Koral Das Gupta, for having me again on your show. Uh, after listening to Professor Chana, ma'am, and... Uh, Professor Ananya Datta, ma'am. Uh, it's my turn. And uh, what I would like to talk about is almost on similar lines because uh, we are talking about uh, spirituality, we are talking about religion, and we are talking about the indigenous group or the idea of indigeneity, which uh, is something which uh, stands to be debated yet again because uh, we in anthropology are very, very particular about being very careful about uh, using terms like indigenous indigeneity today. Uh, but Having said that, when I talk about uh, spirituality and religion and indigenous groups like tribes comes to the mind, then your talk is all about evidence. I saw that uh, word on the mail that you're talking about evidence. So what I'm going to share today is basically my own uh, 
research and my own lived experience. Fortunately, I belong to Lucknow, but I've been staying in Shillong. And all I can say that is that the word tribe is anything but homogeneous. You know, I mean, I see here the Khasi and the Garo, I intermix with them. They are heavily under the influence of Christianity. Mostly all of them are Christians. But when it comes to their religion, you go into the interiors of Meghalaya and you realize that, I realize that spirituality or religion is as per the convenience, need and suitability of people. We constitute them. We construct them. And one of the anthropologists, Malinowski, has very clearly stated that religion is something on magic rituals or anything to do with faith is very closely associated with the mindset of the people. You know, we are anxiety written. So we will approach a power. So uh, when I look at the tribes in Northeast and particularly where I am, Meghalaya, I realize that if religion is talking of syncretism here, what to choose from the indigenous religion while safely remaining a Christian? How you remain very close to the Bible and still not give up your own traditional religion? How the two stand well blended and not as paradoxical realities? This is a beauty which I find tribes have developed for their own sake in order to take their life forward. And my own research had gone in, like Ma'am Channa was saying, my own research also uh, went in a Himalayan community called Boksa. It's in Uttarakhand. And uh, I have been going back to that community right from the time I was a research scholar. So it's been almost 20 years now. It's a primitive, it's a particularly vulnerable tribal group. That's a constitutional terms term used for certain tribes in India, which are still have to catch up to a certain extent in terms of their literacy, in terms of their you know, upcoming, overcoming their poverty. So it's a term which has a developmental connotation attached to it, PBTG. So it's a community where I have been going back and forth. And uh, there, it's very interesting to see how they have, they see religion. You know, we as people who are going to a community, like Madam was saying, ethnographic research, yes, we are there. I mean, you say autoethnography or ethnography, but we are, when we are talking of a people, their lived experiences and their own explanations about what they see as, you know, their faith, that comes forth. And among the Boksa, I realized, through the Boksa, I realized that tribes in India, their understanding of their religion has a very close connection to their history, to the path that they have taken over the years. This particular tribe has been a tribe which is which was erstwhile a primitive tribal group. Today it's a PVTG, basically a community living somewhere in Uttarakhand, a land which was known as a land of malaria and marshes. They were driven away from somewhere from Madhya Pradesh. The legends go like that. Even the gazetteers go that like that. And they made a place for themselves. And then just before independence, in order to generate more land from the Tarai area where the Bhoksas are settled, the government asked the outsiders to come and, you know, make more out of the land on which the Bhoksa were living. So this coming of the outsiders to a community which had never seen outsiders before. So somewhere you understand there was a fear psychosis. There were their lands were taken away. They, you don't become a, a vulnerable tribe overnight. You know, you become vulnerable because there are factors responsible for it. And this particular tribe has a history of land alienation, land being taken away and then that land being regularized by the government. So all those errors in history have given them a reason to come up with their own idea of faith as is important for them to survive. So what I see there is they have their own indigenous religion. They have their own village deity with the belief that the village deity will protect them. They have their own forest gods. And when the outside elements, after the development of transport and communication, mobility increased, people started entering the tribal areas and settled there. So today this community is there, but well surrounded by the very other people, the non-tribes. And they are all living for decades now. But they, the, the Bhoksa people, it's like the more gods we have, the merrier. 
the more protection we are having you know so they have taken up the gods of the hindu pantheon they call themselves hindu they have not left their indigenous gods in fact the tarai is a very strong area of uh, punjabi settlement sikh settlement they even worship guru nanak they they go anywhere where they feel that they are getting protection and some kind of a you know a support to take their life forward their lands are still not with them the land that they had lost was regularized by uh, the government and the trespassers are owning them and these are the realities which you look at the theoretical level you'll realize that the government is talking about stopping land alienation and the land going back to the tribe but when you go to the grassroots level then you realize that the reality is quite different from the claims which have been made over the decades of what the state has been doing for vulnerable or weaker sections so for this community i see they have just taken in as many gods as they want to and there's no contradiction guru nanak is meant for something krishna is meant for something their own bhumiya is meant well village deity is meant for something all are equally important assigned different roles so their understanding is this that it's all about faith i asked them a question i said they i mean my interaction with them was all about all this and then they said you know there is a difference between crime and sin aparad or guna so i said okay what is aparad then what is crime this stealing somebody's money is crime and killing a cow is sin so a tribe where literacy is very low you know they are so clear about the idea of crime and sin and to associate which one to the idea of religion and spirituality which of them out of crime and sin which is more grave for them so when you talk about th this particular community i'm talking of bhoksha then i realize that um in terms of you know sometimes we feel that the term spirituality uh, is something that has an intellectual element attached to it but here you realize that you realize that when we talk about the spiritual aspect of the bhoksha it has all been as per their relationship with the others as per their history how they see themselves as well secured in the current scenario that they are living in and how much of voice do they have you know so that i will not mince my words when i will say that this is a community which is still very much in a situation of fear the more i go to them you know when you read about baseline surveys which the government has conducted about uh, you know pvtgs sending educational reforms building up schools building up hospitals but when you really go to the area you realize that the problem is more deep and the main problem that i have observed is that all the other people living in the erstwhile bhoksha villages now i can't call them bhoksha villages because bhoksha are in a minority there there are others living there whether it is the police whether it is the other people living as their neighbors i found a very condescending attitude towards the bhoksha the very idea that you are a tribe and when i asked them asked the bhoksha you know aap log kon hai who are you says and hum log janjati hai i said janjati matlab jante hai what do you understand by the term janjati then they said yeah we are backward we are jungly we are uneducated that's why we are a anusuchit janjati so this definition of a scheduled tribe anusuchit janjati coming from a bhoksha so i realized one thing that there is has been a very strong sense of being weak sense of being vulnerable sense of that realization that let us not speak much because we are in a situation where we just need to do something to survive and in that how they preserve their culture their population is also less you know but that is one of the reasons why they are in the pvtg category so this is a community which is banking heavily on that idea of religion and spirituality because the more you interact with them the more you get to know about their world view and the more you get to know about their world view you realize i see where you talked about authors here somebody emerging 
there the state is this that my maximum dropouts happen at the middle school stage i hardly see any books are reaching a graduation level there are few of course in gadarpur area we we can't say that they are won't be there but the point is that uh, it is still a very long way for them when they themselves start feeling empowered it's not about what others are doing for them it's about how they develop a sense of confidence and in the meanwhile their idea of religion their heavy banking on religion their idea of faith their idea of trust in that power and that's why they have a line of gods and deities they also worship the muslim peers you know the religious leader among the bhoksa the person who carries out rituals people come to him and he recites all the urdu verses you know he is using those uh, uh, ways of islam in order to make people understand how you can get rid of this problem and how can you get rid of that problem and fortunately in anthropology we really believe in this idea of cultural relativism so we don't ignore all this in the name of you know how silly they are how can you get relief uh, relief of a disease from a reciting a certain verse we believe that yes this is something which is helping the people there so be it because it's a holistic situation so that's where i see and when i come to northeast india literacy is excellent there are there are tribes here gharo khasi in meghalaya the nagas all of them are all over the place very very well educated people and when you look at their religion and their idea of religion they i realize one thing they are very very uh, devout christians they really really know a uh, bible to you know they follow it and as i said they continue to let their own indigenous religion live on in a selective way i am not saying the whole of it but in a selective way how they choose to decide what to take and what to give up whether to do a marriage through the christian way and following the indigenous way in some other uh, for some other institution purpose that's their call but they are taking it all together so um, what i wish to say is that whether we talk about religion whether talk we talk about religion spirituality each community's understanding of it is based on its lived experience its felt needs and it is very different from the other so to have a uh, you know blanket uh, formula about what indigenous religion and spirituality would be i think it will be too much of scratching the surface and not trying to go deeper which one needs to actually so thank you thank you for that thank you so much for uh, these you know thought provoking conjectures which you made and i'm sure uh, we would be delving deeper into it uh, so we'll move on to the question and answer session and my first question is to subhadra ma'am how would you like to place uh, indigenous spirituality in the context with the cultures identities and world view you know firstly as i said that we have to debate the term spirituality spirituality may be understood in a particular way as we is understood in say higher religion spirituality as attaining say god or attaining moksha or liberation or something like that this is what we generally understood as spirituality but as gitika quite rightly pointed out when we are doing dealing with people who are on the brink of existence we can say margins of existence threatened people most most indigenous people across the globe i am not just talking of india they are under threat from the you know more hierarchical more powerful more technologically powerful uh, cultures uh, although the gitika is right in saying that each indigenous uh, group or tribe or community whatever way we may like to indicate they have their own histories their own particularities but there is also this general existence that these are the people whom uh, maybe we can use um, ramachandra guha's terms the ecosystem people the people who live close to nature the people who are away from the technologies of the 
modern world, especially the technologies of destruction and hierarchy. These are, I think, two things that are because most indigenous people are not out there to destroy nature, to what you can colonize nature, but they are had a long history of existence with nature as part of their social world. This is what I was trying to say in the first world that you cannot distinguish between human, non human, that we humans are privileged and those. Um, and if, uh, or those, uh, you know, who are in the forest are just there for us to exploit them. That is not what is found in any indigenous culture or religious society across the globe. You can take the ethnographies. I've extensively gone through the ethnographies of Brazilian, American, Indian, African, maybe not so much in Southeast, uh, no, Eastern uh, Asia, Far Eastern Asia, but in most parts of the world, this is a substratum of um, indigenous existence. So in that sense, uh, spirituality for them is the spirituality of coexistence, the spirituality of emergence with the whole cosmological existence. It is a, it is a spirituality that does not distinguish that God is somewhere out there and we have to go and, you know, attain God. Spirituality of a harmonious coexistence. Harmony is something which is an integral aspect of most people who live and specifically close to nature, close to the conditions of existence. When this harmony gets threatened with external interference, it is this place where they feel threatened, they feel fear, their disjunction. Like I will give you another close example, the Sauras. The Sauras have been studied who believe that their dead, there is nothing called death. There was no nothing called death in the Saura worldview because they believe that the Sauras, once they pass from one existence, just simply pass to another existence where the Relationships remain like the Sauras would have wives and children or husbands and children amongst their among in the dead. They continuously interact. But the Sauras also believe that this is possible only within that Saura, you know, environment. If the Sauras, when they were displaced through various or their environment was destroyed, they lost that. So, which means that once you threaten this harmonious coexisting world where the forest, the deforestation, drying up of streams, can, like the, you know, in the Himalayan, I have mean, also extensive, not only in one place, I have worked in many parts of the Himalayas. What is really threatening are the building of dams, the destruction or deforestation, because then what is happening? The spirits, the uh, power, the supernatural beings who were part of, who lived there, they are, their entire, you know, um, existence of those beings are also being threatened. And this means that they fear that it is probably, and they are right. It, to some extent today, when we see global warming, let me give one example, specific example. Um, a dam was being is being built on the Bapsa River in Kinnor. The local people told me that where the dam is being built is the very is the abode of a very powerful spirit, and the building of the dam will disturb the spirit, and some very disastrous things will happen. I came back to Delhi. I was talking to my uh, colleague in the ge geology department. And he told me they are building a dam in that place. Raksham was the name of the place. That is the confluence of two tectonic plates. It is a very dangerous place to build the dam. No. The local understanding that it is the abode of a spirit translated into scientific terms into the convergence of tectonic plates. Similarly, if you remember, there was this huge dam disaster, the earthquake in uh, Sikkim. 
And the local indigenous people in Sikkim have said that because this happened, because the dam was built similarly at a very sacred point, a very uh, sixteen point. I will give you one more uh, example of this. I saw one uh, documentary, I think it was made by CNN or somebody, about certain American scientists who were going around trying to find, like when they say a place is sacred, it has a lot of power of the American Indians, the sacred spots of the American Indians, and they had some kind of a device for maybe assessing the power vibrations, the earth, you know, the earth vibrations and all. And they found that it was true. Each of these spots, which they identified as being sacred, were giving out powerful vibrations. So uh, the whole point is that Western science, colonization by Western uh, people, has made kind of the Western science as the only science, the only form of knowledge. We have tend, we tend to disbelieve or treat all other non-Western or non-so-called uh, scientific knowledge as trash, but that may not be true. So when, uh, as Gitika has also, I mean, so power can be power that can come from any place. As Gitika rightly called it, can come from an Islamic source, what you call an Islamic source. The indigenous people will not say that. They will say that is another sacred being. This is just like the Jar Bhotia say the Gangotri is sacred, the Ganga is sacred, so is the uh, Tibetan, you know, the Buddhist uh, monastery is sacred, Buddha is sacred, their indigenous gods are sacred. They, all control different parts of the sacred universe, the cosmology. So uh, this wisdom is something which needs to be, and it has been done in many parts of the world. In the Western world, there is a lot of going back to shamanism in let's say like New York or, you know, there are lots of people who are going back or London, people going back to what they call modern witchcraft or shamanism and all. This is a recognition that somewhere this that this cosmology is not all redundant. It is not superstition. It is because this is something which is again built up on century, millions of years of wisdom ever since human existence. So I think these are some points that we need to ponder upon very seriously. Especially in the way the world is getting threatened environmentally and other in other ways. This harmonious coexistence, which is really understood as spirituality amongst the people whom we call tribes. It is, it is a philosophy of existence and which has survived. You see, um, when we look into human history, human evolution, Human beings lived as hunter food gatherers, which is how um, most tribes were. They were today we call them tribes. Almost ninety-nine percent of their existence. This industrial civilization is like a fraction of a second of the entire. So, in this fraction of a second, much more damage has been done to the earth than that millions of years of peaceful coexistence, the natural harmonious coexistence, which was the hunting, food gathering, or the non-industrialized, non-mechanized way of life. Certainly, ma'am. Uh, there is a, you know, real need to look back and to actually analyze what we're doing and what we understand uh, of what we call tribes. So um, on that note, we'll move on to our next question. Um, Ananya, ma'am, would you like to share any interesting experience um, pertaining to the spiritual performances of the indigenous communities in Bengal? Um, well, I don't have an organized description of any, you know, one sustained, uh, shall we say, event, faith event that I watched, but I did mention briefly that I attended a, a marriage function. But before I get to that, um, 
I wanted to say that, you know, the first encounter with the indigenous community living around Shantiniketan for anybody coming to live there or work there is essentially perhaps not spiritual. You encounter them as um, people who work uh, around the place. Uh, and I, I say this also to uh, perhaps highlight the, the problem of disjunction about not being able to enter into the their, their you know their spiritual discourse of spirituality. I say this because um, one of the first images that I associate with the Adivasi woman uh, living in Shantiniketan, there would be many such women who form part of what we call the Mohadol. They come in every day to clean the premises that we uh, then use for our academic purposes. Very grateful to them for doing so. And I admire them. I, I, I often talk to them and my interest in, uh, in, in uh, these ladies is often aesthetic and also to some extent, if you like, uh, inflected by what I see as what I, the fact that I see them essentially as the other people who also work like me, but work in a very different way. And one of the things I associate with them is interestingly the broom. They use the broom uh, and they have a very interesting way of combining the use of two brooms uh, uh, to uh, sweep, uh, shall we say, to clean and mop uh, premises. And for a very long time, uh, right after uh, the famous or infamous Porsche Mala, you know, a, a very the, probably the largest uh, fair, uh, community fair in the Shantiniketan calendar, uh, uh, you know, we would watch with utter amazement and admiration how a group of, uh, of, of Adivasi ladies coming in with their kind of trademark uh, kind of uh, for want of a better word, it's called the gamcha. It's the checkered, uh, you know, uh, uh, equivalent indigenous or equivalent of the towel that they would have around there, you know, uh, kind of very, very neatly tied around their waist. Uh, this is some. This this is almost part something to have grown to see as part of their appearance over very neatly pleated uh, sari. They wear it a very wear it in a very distinctive way, and I have a few uh, photographs to share. So they would clean up the, the the very sprawling mala ground in a matter of hours using techniques which are extremely efficient so my point is that i see that my that one's first encounter with them is as as possessors of or dispensers of a certain kind of skill we don't automatically enter into their spiritual practices we look at them from outside and there are interesting um, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, counter discourses to any kind of, uh, shall we say, um, uh, outsider impression that I might come in with. Because I'd, I would have imagined that like the Adivasi communities in Madhupur that my that I had visited very early on in my childhood, such women, I would have thought that they still wore white, but uh, around Shantiniketan they do not. Um, are uh, they, um, uh, shall we say, there's a there's a certain, I'll, I'll share in a minute, a certain, uh, you know, certain photographs, but I would have, I, I would have expected them to, uh, uh, to, to look a certain way, but they, that, that they attired themselves very differently. And they have, I, I'll show you the pictures and that'll be easier for them. Uh, just a moment, I need to negotiate sharing the slides. In. Uh, I don't have slides. So how does one go about it? Um, share screen, right. Can you see these slides? Can you see these photographs? Yes, I'll... Right. So this is from the wedding. And again, you, you see the disjunction between what I would have thought I would see, what I had been trained to look for in the appearance of the Adivasi uh, woman uh, from uh, paintings by, and you know uh, murals by Nandolal all around the place of so the idealized image of a distinctive 
um, way of, um, of, of, shall we say, uh, or cultural practice, which would be tied up with spiritual um, elements too. This is a painting. Uh, this is this is how uh, I, a particular um, Adivasi woman who whom I had seen at a at a at a Vishu Bharati function, and I took this photograph of hers because I found her appearance very distinctive indeed. But I I cannot say that everyone uh, would be attired exactly like her. Um, many wear traditional um, printed saris. Moshumi, the student I mentioned the other day. Um, uh, you know, was telling me about how there is this particular ritual at um, Adivasi weddings, and she would have had uh, gone through the same thing, where there's an overlap between what the Bengali Hindu custom of having a guy holub using, you know, there's ritual around turmeric, but the explanation that they provide uh, for uh, using a simple cotton linen sari uh, shall we say, um, dyed yellow is utterly different and has a kind of um, stark socioeconomic uh, economic story to it that that is nothing that would probably not be relatable to uh, a, an upper class Bengali Hindu uh, you know uh, practice. And she says how it would be seen as a kind of a transference of the fantasy of decking the girl in a lot of uh, golden jewelry. So the yellow, the golden yellow color dye of the sari would be seen as a kind of substitute for, uh, and a kind of wishful substitution of the desire on the part of the parents, the girl's parents, to cover her up in, uh, in, in gold. Uh, so this, it's a projection of uh, similar desires, you know, but the the way in which it manifests itself in in the myth, uh, you know, has it has um, foundations in socioeconomic reality that would be uh, that that are very specific to the Adivasi lived in experience. So that I I can relate to what Dr. Chandran was talking about when she said that faith practices, cultural practices, are uh, are shall we say, uh, in many ways. Uh, deeply connected to, organically kind of engendered by the socioeconomic reality. There, it comes out of need, a fundamental need of survival and uh, self-preservation. Um, speaking of faith, I'm speaking a little randomly, maybe later on uh, I'll have um, opportunity to kind of tie up the loose ends. I wanted to uh, show this photograph because we often have... Um, Adivasi women commissioned in this very distinctive dress, both at Vishwabharati cultural events, particularly Sriniketan cultural events, and um, non Vishwabharati, even non in, uh, institutional programs around Shantiniketan. And so it would often be, kind of begin with the ritual dance with uh, the ladies kind of balancing that. Um, that pot on their heads and quite an acrobatic act an acrobat acrobatism acrobatism is part of it excuse me acrobatism is part of it and uh, but i would I, i'm sure that some kind of faith is uh, would be um, uh, uh, shall we uh, you know the the matrix upon which uh, such a dance uh, is founded but i am i am not privy to that i am seeing this as a physical um, uh, exercise. I'm seeing this as a skill. So to go back to what I began with, uh, the way we perceive the Adivasi is largely filtered through um, what I, what their, you know, their physical presence, their form, their uh, corporeal practices, and, and the dance plays a very important part in it. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, of course, um, when we are not experiences, experiencing these rites and rituals, except perhaps at the wedding, and I'll have a photograph of that, of a community dance. If you're not part of that, if you are putting them up on stage, as they often are, uh, and turned into entertainers and performers, that uh, very fundamental organic connect between the faith that inspires these 
physical acts, these performative acts, and the acts themselves is somewhere disrupted and compromised. And that is, I think, a great injustice to, and perhaps a very convoluted and, um, and disingenuous way of approaching uh, this whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, project of trying to understand them or understand their spirituality. So I, I have never had the opportunity to go up to one of these ladies. I hope I will, and I certainly shall. Uh, not just ask them about how they manage to, uh, you know, kind of uh, keep that. Uh, so wonderfully poised on their heads, but what it represents, because it would be something um, relatable in terms of the Mangal cut to perhaps a, a, you know, a Hindu, even as the ex explanation that the community might have, the Adivasi community, for what that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, you know, that, uh, if you like, that pot represents might be totally different. And so we cannot assume uh, there's no axiomatic reading. We cannot assume, we cannot subsume their mythology under any broader, uh, uh, shall we say, hegemonic um, uh, mythological uh, knowledge system. I think it would be a grave injustice to do that. Uh, the one uh, kind of theoretical framework that I, that I found or thought of as being, um, if you like, um, uh, applicable here, for want of a better word, would be Claude Levi-Strauss's. I'm speaking in the presence of anthropologists, so I say this with a lot of trepidation, but I've always found uh, Claude Levi-Strauss's uh, delightful essay, uh, The Structural Study of Myth, uh, a very, very serviceable in this context in terms of how it explains to us how mythologies uh, travel uh, even, I mean, uh, you know, travel very far globally and also between contiguous cultures such as, say, uh, the Brahmos uh, who live in Shantiniketan or the, or the, uh, the Hindu uh, and Birbhum is steeped in, uh, you know, a kind of traditional Hindu rituals and practices which are uh, decidedly paganist. Uh, I have perhaps seen a little bit of traditional Adivasi practices. But uh, many, many years after I started living there, it's only last year, I met, I happened to attend uh, Durga Puja, um, you know, um, uh, uh, ritual, a particular evening ritual, uh, which was about offering sacrifice, you know, symbolic sacrifice. No animal was sacrificed at that particular uh, puja, but it was a symbolic sacrifice. So, uh, the, the very name uh, Bolpur, uh, the town contiguous to Shantiniketan, uh, is mired in uh, the history of such uh, sacrifices, the ritual sacrifices. And Moshumi was telling me about similar sacrifices, animal sacrifices in the Adivasi community. But uh, so there are extraordinary overlaps. Having said that, Levi Strauss's structural study of mythology explains how you know, myths can travel and myths can in a very kind of fascinatingly protean sort of way take on different identities uh, without, uh, you know, uh, and, and still stay the same. Uh, so th there's, so, um, you know, there are, we can talk in terms of, uh, excuse me, just a moment. Shall I remove this now? Yes, um, it's just that all the best. You have to go now. Okay. We'll talk. To, we'll talk uh, once I'm. I'm when once this is come to a close, we'll talk. Take care. So um, I'm sorry about that brief interruption. Uh, my, so um, so it's it's interesting how I found a lot of overlaps, and so in many ways this was a, a huge learning experience for me. Uh, going to a wedding, talking to a, a woman, uh, a, a, a girl, a woman who has recently got married and so who's privy to these rituals who is, uh, and who has who is, who is participated in them. And also then all a kind of um, uh, interconnecting them with narratives of uh, based on uh, experiences that I have had uh, completely as an outsider. This is another image from that. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, music and dance are a, a, a very intrinsic part of any kind of 
uh, Adivasi faith practice. Um, uh, 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 and these are paintings by Nandulal Bose. I, I wanted to get take take you to this one in particular, extraordinary painting where you have the whole movement, the energy, and the the, the dynamism of the community dance is uh, so. Uh, shall we say, uh, stirringly represented. Uh, here too, there is, uh, and I'm going to, sorry about being a little chaotic, it's just my, uh, that I, uh, I hope you'll excuse me. So a few days back, I, this is quite, uh, shall we say, accidentally, I, on a drive around the environs of Shantiniketan, and uh, we came by, my husband and I had gone out on a drive, and we came by this um, this spot. Uh, there's another one, there are certain other images. Um, and I was very intrigued to see uh, little statuettes of horses. Um, I even put this question to Moshumi, but uh, she wasn't able to place that, so to speak. But it ties up with the point that Moshumi made about you know, there being no specific site for uh, worship. Um, uh, you know, worship is not just not institutionalized. The spatialization of, you know, that it's almost pantheistic in the sense that Moshumi said you could sit down anywhere uh, that you thought was suitable for offering prayers, and that would become, for the moment, uh, the consecrated space. Um, and so there are these little spots of little, shall we say, uh, out, out, you know, open or open air or uh, chapels of worship everywhere around um, neighborhoods, uh, you know, where which are populated by the uh, by the by the Adivasi community. And uh, even as Moshumi uh, was not able. To or I perhaps, perhaps did not make this, put this question to her. I'm intrigued by the fact that there are animal images. So even as on the one hand, I talk about animal sacrifice that should not be read as, um, uh, as, an, as an act of savagery. Uh, we all know about uh, the idea of sacral viol violence as, uh, if you like, um, uh, Fraser uh, postulates it or theorizes it. And then, of course, um, also uh, Girard uh, postulates or, or theorizes it. And sacral violence in all traditional or pagan faiths is always about transferring, um, you know, um, attributes um, in a very anthropomorphic way onto either inanimate or animate beings. So this is their way of acknowledging uh, the animate and the inanimate into social human existence. So, um, so, so if if there is sacrifice on the one hand, there's violence on the other, on the one hand. There's also, uh, you know, uh, a kind of everyday organic gesturing towards uh, the animate and the inanimate and the non-human uh, presence, the non-human ecological presence. And then this is a fundamental aspect of how the, the Adivasis conduct themselves. Um, one of the, the, the stories that um, Moshumi shared with me about uh, why uh, the groom and the bride, the bridegroom and the bride are kind of hoisted onto, uh, uh, you know, uh, cane baskets specially made for the purpose. They are hoisted into the air. And so the fine, the ritual of, um, of, of putting vermilion is actually done literally mid air. Uh, in Bengali Hindu practice, there's the use of the piri, you know, but here it's the basket, it's a cane basket that's made out of uh, a very easily available, um, uh, shall we say, uh, arboreal matter. And the, but of course, the, the myth that's attached to that practice is that uh, at, at some, in some prehistoric past, uh, a male and a female duck had fallen in love mid-air and had uh, got married mid-air and had even kind of uh, given birth to or laid, laid, laid eggs and given birth to and kind of nested and given birth to their, um, uh, their, their uh, shall we say, 
duckling uh, mid-air. And so that became the, the, the beginning of this fascinating practice of, of family members and peers holding the bride and the groom up into the air. And so it, it's, I think it's a great kind of tes testimony to uh, the extent to which uh, the non-human as well as the, uh, shall we say, literally the inanimate have been uh, assimilated into uh, everyday uh, uh, Adivasi faith practice and cultural practices. So to go back to the point I was making about uh, you know, just almost a kind of a l opacity of the, the form of the Adivasi, the physical form, and us not being able to delve any further or looking behind that form. Somewhere I see that I have encountered that same kind of aporia. You know, I don't know about uh, the, the actual um, purpose of such a, of such a days in the middle of nowhere. Um, uh, so what I'm looking at is a physical space. What I'm looking at uh, are images, icons, uh, and a certain kind of iconography. And I stumble at its, uh, at its, uh, in front of it because there's a there's a there's a gap in my knowledge. Uh, so somewhere I think that has to be overcome if we really want to understand. And the and the physical and the spiritual are not the natural and the. Um, the, if you like, the concrete and the abstract, uh, you know, I think in terms of textual attributes, so please forgive my uh, wording. These uh, are not separable. These are, um, uh, shall we say, uh, inter-existent uh, when it comes to tribal uh, practices. So uh, that's the Shantali family. That's the, Ananana. you know, the wonderful form. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should may I, have rambled Shall I a interrupt? Little. Yeah, yes. I'll just interrupt you a bit. Uh, yes. Subhadra, ma'am, uh, will need to leave because we are yes. already going overboard the time. So um, thank you so much, ma'am. All yes. right, ma'am, you can continue. Um, we'll take one more question with uh, Geetika, ma'am, and uh, probably we'll have to wind up the session. Sure. Ma'am, you can uh, go forward with what you were saying. Ananya, ma'am? Yes? Uh, you can you can complete uh, if I have interrupted, yeah. Oh, I thought I, I, I needed to stop. I'm so sorry if I held up uh, the discussion. But um, do, I, do I carry on from where I left off? Is... Yes, ma'am. Uh, in short, you can just uh, uh, conclude so that we can uh, go up to the next question. Um, right, it would be difficult to, uh, I know uh, and this, that's probably a lot that I would have wanted to say, but that's, um, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of um, argue that we, are, that we have not really negotiated uh, or we have not really kind of engaged uh, with due immersion, the uh, the exact areas of zones of overlap between their culture and their spiritual practices, um, and um, and any encounter that I've had with the Adivasi community from the outside has only sensitized me to that issue. So that's what I was trying to get. To. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, and uh, sorry for interrupting you uh, uh, while you were you know telling uh, you know such fascinating facts so uh, our last uh, question uh, for the day is to Geetika ma'am ma'am how do we characterize indigenous spirituality do do you think uh, it has been misappropriated and uh, if yes how uh, no I don't think it has been misappropriated we can actually not boil down the whole gamut of uh, uh, indigenous spirituality in one word like, uh, you know, uh, inappropriation. Uh, it's it's a complex term. So um, I would say, no, it's not been inappropriated. If we talk about characterization of indigenous uh, spirituality, 
like madam channa had said that there are certain features which we can say that uh, some way characterize the spiritual world of the indigenous people now those are common features like their own uh, understanding of their environment and how do they associate the environment with uh, with the idea of faith and both connected to their idea of survival because uh, indigenous populations as a matter of history have lived in remote areas in difficult terrains and for them to come up from those areas and to continue to survive and to make their life more qualitative the whole idea of understanding their cosmos with an element of uh, who is a benevolent power and who is a malevolent power you know the nature and the faith is coming together and this is one of the aspects of tribal spiritual or indigenous spiritual spirit indigenous spirituality the correlation so it's not misappropriated but having said that i can also say that um one needs to go beyond the general to the specific and uh, then identify that for each uh, indigenous community what has it's been its line of uh, journey over history and then how they have conceptualized their own understanding of their religion and spirituality so i think uh, it goes both ways going from the general to the specific from the macro to the mi micro thank you so much ma'am i'm ma not taking I much time because we've already exceeded yes uh, and we could hear you you know continuously but then we have a constraint of time that's sad unfortunate so um this brings us to the end of today's session i would like to thank all the panelists once again for sharing their invaluable perspectives on the topic this is to remind that we are calling for submission on tribal literature and tribal representation in literature the tapes of which can be viewed on www.tellmeyourstory.biz till then good night everyone thank you very much for having us thank you